this. On today's episode of the CLS Experience, we have a very special treat. He went from being arrested 17 times before his 18th birthday to being featured in Forbes several times over. He turned his life around by betting on himself and his personal development. He's a badass entrepreneur, speaker, philanthropist, and United States Navy veteran. He's the CEO, founder, and pulse behind the best on the planet lifestyle brand and meal prep company, the legendary Nutrition Solutions. His mindset is absolutely bulletproof. And whether he knows it or not, he's been a silent mentor of mine for the last four years since my first meal prep with his brand. He's just an overall juggernaut in all facets of life and a terrific human being. Please welcome the iconic Chris Cavallini. How you doing, Chris? Wow, brother, that was quite an introduction. Thank you so much both for that. I mean, that was, uh, that was powerful. Good. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on today. Yeah, I take great pride in those. And like I was saying to you before you, we went on air, you know, I know you do a lot of these, you have one, you're on fire and you do anything and so do I, but we'll definitely keep this fresh and exciting cool. and different. You played such a major role in my life and everyone that, you know, we have 250,000 downloads on podcast so far. I always talk about your company, your brand, and, and it's more than just a meal prep. It's like, a, it's a movement, so to speak. It's a lifestyle and I'll continue sending people your way until my last breath and I appreciate you. Oh, thank you, brother. I, we appreciate that. Hell yeah. The audience always loves to get a feel for the journey and so forth. And yours is like no other. But before we dive into that, we're going to get a little weird. You ready for me? Yeah. Chris, what's your superpower? Oof. My ability to endure. Resilience. Yeah. Call it, call it what you will. Um, you know, something along the way, I, I realized that, uh, you know, no matter how hard things get and how impossible the circumstances may appear to be um if you're not willing to quit eventually it just kind of happens you know and that's the that's the problem and, and i'm sure we'll cover that at some point of this interview um most people you know they 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 get a little taste of discomfort or experience a little pain and uh, suffering and and you know they they take that as a sign that they're not going in the right direction in fact it's actually the opposite when you feel that pain that discomfort when things get hard as hell and everything you know within you is telling you to quit that's how you basically have experienced objective validation from the universe that you are in fact on the right path. I love that. And I, I feel like at this point, like you've almost associated pain with pleasure because you've been through so much. And so why, you know, that when you start to feel that on the other side of that is real growth. And you're right. A, a lot of people yes. feel that and they reverse course. Yeah, I mean, our 2 million year old brains, I mean, that's debatable how long our, uh, how old our brains are, but, you know, we're, we're designed biologically and uh, have evolved to purposefully avoid discomfort. So it's not just something that comes natural. It's not something that, you know, some of us come out of our uh, mother's vaginas and are just built <laughs> like this. You know, it requires a dedicated effort, consistency, discipline. And like I said, just the ability to, uh, just to, to, to experience that hardship and keep pushing through it. And eventually you get to a point where it's not that it, it just, it stops hurting. It, it just doesn't hurt as much anymore because you be, it becomes part of your baseline. And then you just also have to realize that what you're focusing on essentially will determine your outcome. So if you're focused on how hard it is and you know, how, how, how much it sucks or inconvenient it may be, you know, the time and energy that it takes, you know, that's not going to get you anywhere. You got to focus on the positive, the upside that comes out of it. Cause I will tell you uh, earlier in my journey, this was something I struggled with. I thought that at some point of the uh, climb up the success ladder that I wouldn't feel the stress anymore. And I wouldn't feel overwhelmed that I wouldn't feel or have all these problems going on. And uh, that didn't materialize. And that, that really was a hard thing for me to comprehend. And uh, inevitably I through uh, psychedelic experience basically gained the perspective that every new level uh, of success and every new level of you is going to come with it a new level of discomfort. The discomfort is essentially the price of admission to a successful life. But if you're focusing on that next level, the progress that you're making, the, 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 the steps that you need to take to uh, you know, continue to move forward, 
you don't even really notice or feel the discomfort. It's when you're solely focused on the pain, the suffering, the hardship that it uh, essentially over overrides your senses, consumes you, and um, you know basically is the reason most people quit. Such great points, brother. And I love the way you articulate it. And so true, like for those people who don't really take a shot at life and they're just coasting, maybe they don't feel a lot of discomfort, right? But anyone like yourself and like the legends and you know people who want to make a dent in the universe, they're going to take a swing at life. Like in come the obstacles, it's just the way it works, but you should embrace that. True, yeah, lean into it, lean into discomfort. And uh, you know, the way that you do that will give people just some practical action steps. Cause again, like I went through, you had alluded in my uh, bio, my intro, that I was arrested 17 times prior to my 18th birthday. I was arrested a lot more after that, but I grew up under some untraditional circumstances. Um, not everybody grows up in that dynamic. so. I, uh, I faced adversity early on in life. And, you know, although at the time I wasn't aware of it, it, it really conditioned me uh, later to be able to, you know, maybe withstand a little more than the average person. But if you're the average person and you haven't faced adversity, like, you know, you got to recognize that it, it, the ability to face adversity and, and adversity uh, in and of itself, it's, a, it's an honor and it's a privilege because not everybody has what it takes to rise up and you know conquer the adversity so the way that you get yourself to that point where you know you uh develop that bulletproof mindset is by doing things proactively and consistently that are uncomfortable do those hard workouts hit training uh you know cold showers first thing in the morning ice baths you know saunas just things that or just in general you know i have a rule that every day i do something that just sucks that i don't want to fucking do um by doing that and learning to kind of act in spite of your feelings, it uh, makes it a little easier to navigate through the storm when the inevitable, uh, you know, problems of life uh, hit. I love that. And I love the reframing the perspective. Agree with all this stuff. If you're on absolute fire today, you can't be stopped. Chris, <laughs> at this point right now, what makes you feel most alive? Whew, man, uh, what makes me feel most alive? I would say, Seeing the people uh, around me, the people that I've been working with and, 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 you know, pouring into and developing, seeing them rise up, seeing them uh, grow, witnessing them just go from one place to another and, and, and just being able to recognize, you know, the, the progress they're making, being just grateful for, you know, the opportunity to be a small part of their journey and just getting the gratification that comes along with uh, seeing my team uh, grow and accomplish success and uh, just move forward. I mean, I, th that energy, it's, uh, I thrive off it. It feels great. I can't get enough of it. And, um, you know, I put a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy uh, into the people uh, on my team. And it's, you know, not all motivational speeches and high fives, uh, to be honest with you. I'm very hard on my team in a lot of uh, instances and, and, and circumstances. You know, when you're in the business of changing lives, you, you cannot expect that that work is going to be easy. So, uh, you know, I hold myself to a very high standard and I expect my team to do the same. And, you know, where the, the, the goal is to win. And, you know, in, in this context with their business, winning um, is basically synonymous with impacting and helping people change their lives, in some cases, saving them. So, um, you know, when I'm, when I'm able to see somebody on my team just level up, evolve and be at a higher uh, place in life and, and, and being, being able to reward them with a raise or it's it just, it's, it, it makes me feel just that validation inside that uh, it, it's all worth it. The struggle, the hardship, the sacrifice, it's all worth it. And then I'm happy for them because I know that, uh, you know, with that come up in quality of life comes more opportunity, more the ability to do more of the things that you enjoy, the freedoms that come with, uh, you know, being a little more financially free. So um, yeah, for sure. The thing that kind of drives me and, and, and makes me feel uh, most alive without question is seeing the people around me succeed. Love it all, brother. And you talk about leadership. And I know you're also a big advocate of the New England Patriots, the way that yeah. everyone checks the ego at the door. Everyone has a role to play. And as a, yeah. as a united front, as a unit together, obviously one of the best sports teams, you know, ever. And yeah. I could vouch for you. And I just want to give you pops and acknowledge you. You're a great leader. You know, I see the way you operate. And you have the mantra that the camera is always on. Like even if you're not at your 
you know, with, with the gang, so to speak, or with your employees, your home, whatever the case may be, like in your head, the camera's always on, like you're always out working, you're waking up early, you're getting that edge and so forth. You practice what you preach. And I acknowledge you again. I appreciate that. Thank you, brother. Yeah, you got it, man. I mean, what's the other option, right? <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. So. Before we dive deep into the journey, I got to ask you, whether it be present or past, mm -hmm. who's your all-time favorite wrestler? Man. I know you got a lot of friends. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. So, but, <laughs> but, but honestly, like I would uh, prefer to answer that from a, like a nostalgic when I was a child uh, perspective and then as an adult, because as a kid, I don't know if you grew up on it. I grew I up on it. I did. Yeah. I mean, our, 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 I'm, I'm 38 years old and, and during young. 38 years young. Yeah. During that, uh, that period, uh, pro wrestling was basically a staple of every male child's life this is before tiktok and fucking <laughs> internet and all this shit um so yeah back then i mean you know i, I loved hulk hogan uh, i loved uh uh the legion of doom those were a few of my favorites you know now man as crazy as this to say um because you know this is a guy that uh is a personal friend and he's a client I, uh, I would say edge. I would say edge because, Love you know, edge. yeah, like 10 years ago, I was just a big fan of him, big fan of his work. And then it was so, uh, you know, interesting when the, our, our paths crossed and we started to work together and he just worked really, really hard, which a lot of people, man, I, I hope that at some point, um, people are able to see maybe at the end of his career when everything's said and done, he has worked so hard over these last couple of years to come back from that injury. He had career ending neck surgery, retired as the world champion uh, in 2012, came back in better shape than he'd ever been in his entire career. At years old. And he, he, I mean, he worked his ass off and uh, I just, I've always liked his character, appreciated his vibe. And he's just a great human being. Like he is legitimately just the most uh, just laid back, humble, interesting individual. Um, the conversations we have are phenomenal, but um, taking all personal shit out of it. I mean, I was a fan of his before we became friends. So yeah, uh, for sure, he's one of my favorites. It's a great answer and I absolutely agree. And I remember obviously recently when he came back from what was considered a career ending injury, obviously I'm a huge fan. I'll never forget the pop he got at the Royal Rumble, but I didn't know you guys were working together, but then I saw him post and I was like, of yeah. course he's working with Chris. Yeah. looking more shredded than he's ever looked in his entire life so kudos. yeah we had to we had to keep that confidential because you know i have have a reputation within that industry i've worked with a lot of wrestlers um you know whether they were just looking to step their game up or make a comeback of uh, of sort so yeah it was really important that we kept everything uh quiet as you know he began the process to get ready and it was actually interesting you know with him when we first connected there was no um, discussion or idea uh, about him coming back. He just reached kind of a, a, a low point, um, you know, lost his, lost his mom and, and you know, his, his mom raised him, lost his mom, lost his uh, father-in-law, just let himself go as a professional athlete, uh, you know, and he was getting winded and like, you know, not able to keep up with his kids. And he just wanted to get control of his life back and start eating better and, and, and feeling better and, and just, you know, being able to kind of, set a good example for his children. And through that process evolved just these possibilities and opportunities. And next thing you started to feel really good, started to look good, you know, decided to jump in the ring one day and just kind of, you know, run the ropes a little bit. And he's just kind of started just exploring these options and lo and behold, um, you know, he's doing big things now. So yeah, he is kudos to you guys. And obviously love edge. So it's a great answer in my opinion. All right. So I know the audience loves to get a little bit of journey. You often say that you came from humble beginnings. To, you know, that's a, a great understatement, in my opinion. Your mom had you very young, mm -hmm. and then you were in and out of foster care, correct? Yes. You also lived, I know you lived with your grandma, who you didn't have yeah. the best relationship with. Yeah. And, you know, look, I, the truth of the matter is, is I, I, I love everything about you. I know so much about you because I'm a fan, and also because preparation breeds confidence. So yes, sir. <laughs> I wanted to be prepared. Yeah, I, I talk, love it. I could talk to you for six hours, but I want to get to the nitty gritty. Yeah. What, point where you were kind of going to go either back into the system or maybe or maybe jail and then your yeah. your friend basically said you can come yeah. live with us yeah that was a big yeah. moment for you guys. yeah he, yeah so when i was uh i was 17 years old at the time and uh again i i my mother had me when she was 16 she was in no position my father had taken off before i was even born uh she was in no position to raise a child she had um a lot of problems we could just keep it at that making a long story short 
my unorthodox kind of upbringing, I, I had some issues. I had anger issues. I had resentment issues, uh, insecurity, low self-esteem, uh, no confidence, all of these things. Um, you know, you alluded to the fact that I didn't have a great relationship with my, uh, my grandmother. I did it. Um, we both had our issues. I mean, I was, I wasn't a good kid. I mean, like that could probably sum it up. Um, and making a long story short, you know, I, uh, got was getting in trouble uh often you know you had mentioned i was arrested 17 times prior to my 18th birthday i was just too much you know for her and ended up uh back in the court system and you know knew i had a court date coming up and knew that there was a very strong possibility that they were going to basically uh remove me from the care of my grandmother and uh interject me back uh into the system or into a, a group home and you know obviously 17 years old, you have kind of established a little bit of a life, a life for yourself. I was in high school. Um, that wasn't ideal, uh, by any means. And, uh, you know, nor was I going to let it happen. I made up my mind that in the event, uh, that was the situation I would just run away and I would just figure it out. I'd been on my own before I figured I would be able to do it again, but I wasn't going to go into some stranger's house again at 17 years old or go into a group home. You go into group homes, you know, it, 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 you're not around um, the, it's not the best environment, right? You're in an environment full of uh, shit, people like I was at the time, right? Like troublemakers, juvenile delinquents, people with issues and, and things like that. But uh, I was telling the story to a friend of mine at the time. And, and, you know, he basically suggested that I come live with him and his parents. And he just said it like so nonchalantly and casually. And like, I was just thinking to myself, I'm like, man, that's really amazing of you to say, uh, but I think the problem there would be, I've, I've, I've never met your mom and your dad, I, I met one time for about 15 seconds. So it was like, well, listen, just keep it in mind and let keep me posted and, you know, whatever uh, ends up happening, just to just let me know, and we'll see what we can do. And, you know, I, I didn't want to have to rely on, you know, calling him and being in that position of lack and, and being in that vulnerable, weak position. I, I, I actually worked very, very hard as a, as a teenager to, to try to purposely avoid not being in that situation. I mean, I, would, I wouldn't eat at uh, school lunch because I was always too embarrassed to uh, stand in line where I would have to get the free lunches from. And um, instead of you know, going to lunch, I would, I would leave and I would go for a walk. And again, I, I always wanted to avoid being in those situations when at all possible, but court came and went and, and, and you know, like, just like I thought, they, uh, the, the Department of Social Services took me from the courtroom, took me to their office, which was very far from uh, where my hometown was and where court was. And basically, I'm in the office for about five, six hours, and they're just having a very, very difficult time, um, you know, big surprise, finding a family that was willing to bring in a 17 year old who has been arrested, you know, over a dozen times at that point with behavior issues, trust issues, anger issues, uh, you know, violent tendencies. So I basically went and knocked uh, on the door of one of the, uh, the uh, social services workers and, and had mentioned that uh, a friend of mine and uh, there, his, his, his amazing family said that they'd be glad to take me in if they're having a problem. And I was like, I got a solution. And they said, well, they, they said that. And I, I basically said that I'm, oh yeah, they said that. And basically made it seem like this was like a done deal. And this was something that they were fully prepared for. We had not had a conversation about it since that brief interaction that I just mentioned. And they said, well, why don't you give uh, them a call and we'll talk to them and, 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 and we'll see what we can do. So, I mean, at that point I was just like, okay, I, I got one shot at this and I, was able to get a hold of my friend and I basically told him like, look, man, I'm, I'm in this, the office right now of uh, social services and uh, I'm trying to figure this out. Um, they're, they're, they're trying to send me to a home. There's nowhere to go. So what ends up happening from here is I go to a group home and I told them this, I'm not going to let that happen. And I, I said, uh, I know you mentioned it before and, and I know it's, it's, it's such a big ask. I said, but is there any way possible you'd be willing to talk to your parents and see if, uh, you know, they can help me. And he said to give him a call back in, in 10 minutes or so. And he would talk to him and, and let me know. And I did. And, you know, that time, uh, it seemed like, you know, hours or days passing by, you know, I'm just, just feeling in the pit of my stomach, a lot on the line here. And I called him back and uh, I 
got a hold of him and, and he said that uh, his parents said that they would love to have me come stay with them. So that was um, amazing. And the social services uh, worker spoke to his parents. At this point, I had not spoken to them yet. The first time that I met his mother, the first time that I had any interaction with her or you know, laid my eyes on her was when I showed up to her doorstep with the social services worker, with my bag in hand. She opened the door with this just warm, welcoming smile and just this, this loving, caring vibe, something that I just hadn't ever experienced at that point. And she said, welcome home, Chris. And at that point, my, that was a, that was one of, uh, I would say three or four pivotal uh, moments for the trajectory of my life. Because being in that household, I lived with them for six or seven months. Um, it really, it, it really, it, it helped me as a person, just having that those good vibrations and people who supported each other and actually enjoyed being around each other, having dinner at the table, things that I wasn't accustomed to. Um, it was just such an extraordinary feeling. And uh, it also gave me a little bit of insight into, uh, at the time, like the importance of who and what you're surrounding yourself with. Now, at that time, I wasn't consciously aware of that. I wasn't thinking like, oh, wow, like, you know, it's really important that I surround myself with the right people in life. I want to live a good life. But that, you know, looking back on that, that was absolutely the first example um, of that, you know, well-known, uh, you know, well-documented uh, fact um, that I was able to experience. And, you know, without question, they played a huge role in my cognitive development. And, and you know, I was still a, a shithead, you know, living with them for six months didn't completely change me, but it did help put some positive in there, which, um, you know, for sure, to this day, I'm still just so grateful for the, uh, for the involvement they have, they've had in my life and, and continue to have in my life. What a valuable story and lesson. I appreciate that so much. And it's like Chris, and for the audience listening, this is so valuable. Chris talks about being surrounded by positive energy. And on the flip side, like misery kills, like being around yeah. negative people or bad influences, you can drown in that. But Chris had a taste for the first time of some positive reinforcement. And, and you might not have done a 180 at that time, but you were exposed to the power of community and support. I love that. Yeah, it was it was uh, it was impactful, and and it was noticed uh, as well by you know my uh, the teachers, the uh, my probation officer. Like it was very obvious ap apparent that yeah that my vibe was uh, was different, and um, you know I look back at that, and that again when we're young we don't think about those things, but I mean straight up like just to, before we transition in the next part of this discussion like. The people you surround yourself with are either making your life better or making it worse. They're either raising your standards or lowering your standards. And there's literally no middle ground. Um, so you got to be aware of that. You, you got to know that and you have to be selective. It has to be a conscious, voluntary thought process that you invest toward the people that you're spending time with. And this, nobody is off limits here, uh, especially your oldest friends, your family members, like even your parents, like if somebody is making, if somebody's involvement in your life is, is hindering your prosperity or detracting from your quality of life, like you have a responsibility to do something about that. That doesn't mean you have to go to war with them. That doesn't mean it has to be like, you know, this big theatrical uh, event, but you do have to create some space there because your vibration is influenced by that of the people that you let around you. We have one life to live and, you know, we have a responsibility to do the best uh, we can during the one life. And you can't do positive things if you're surrounded by negative people. No, no question, brother. And, and I know you just said one life. And like I say it often, I know it's cliche, but we don't get to do this twice. No. And like, since I pivoted from Wall Street and I started my CLS brand and stuff like that, and, it, and it's taken off and, and I'm so grateful, but I've lost a lot of relationships like you just mentioned, because there were That's certain- good. Yeah, hell yeah. There were certain people in my life that it is what it is. When I interacted with them, they had the ability to lower my state. Maybe yeah. that's on me. Maybe the joke's on me for allowing it, but I acknowledge it and I chose to separate myself and surround myself with people like you that are, that are bettering and yep. influence and so forth. And like minded. So much more fun. Yeah, like minded. And the, the, the thing is, you know, for your listeners who are obviously on a journey of some kind to better themselves, if they weren't, they wouldn't be listening to this. You got to know 100%. And you don't hear this a lot, or you don't hear it enough. When 
you're on that journey, you're on the climb, you're putting in the work to better yourself and you start to come up a little bit. Like people that you were once close, close with, people you once rolled with, people who you, know, you felt that you had a good relationship with, things are going to change. Okay, they're gonna start looking at you different. They're not gonna support you. Uh, look, they might hate on you behind your back. They are not gonna be what it is that you would think they would be and what they were when you were at that lower level. The worst mistake that anybody can make, one that I've made for many, many years during my uh, initial ascent was spending any amount of time and energy like worrying about that, like trying to like sell yourself and your dreams and your goals and why you're doing what you're doing to these motherfuckers who obviously don't have the same ambition, don't have the same drive, don't have the same values, don't, don't have the same interest in bettering themselves. The absolute worst thing you can do, and people do this all the time. Again, I did it for many years in the, in the beginning stages of my growth is like try to like win those people over and think that like you need their support or you need their nod of approval and validation. You do not need that. In fact, you know, when they give you those indications that they are those type of people, that is the, like, you need to look at that as the universe doing you a favor and understanding that now that you know what this person is about, like that gives you the opportunity right then and there to immediately cut them out of your life. Because the more shitty people like that, that you are able to free yourself of and uh, just, you know, remove yourself from, you know, their energy, their presence, the faster you're going to go. Like, no matter how much positive energy you have, if there is negative energy around you, it is going to, it's going to halt your ascent. It's going to slow you down. It's going to make the shit a lot more painful than it actually has to be. And, you know, we all have this weird willingness or, or uh, this, call it, desire to be a savior to all these people when you start doing a little better and you start making changes you look at people who clearly need to make some fucking changes and you think i can help this person like i can put them on to something that'll help them sort that out and you can tell them exactly what to do and how to do it you know like if somebody wants to do it that's fine but it's normally not the case normally they just end up presenting you for that thinking that, you know, you think that you're better than them. And, and, you know, you just have to recognize their issues, not with you, it's with themselves. And uh, look, the, the, the fact is like, you have an obligation to win and you cannot win in life if you're surrounded by losers. Ah, I, I love all this brother. And, and like, you could obviously see, let me know if you know a good surgeon because that the surgeon can move the smile from my face. Your child. <laughs> my man, I appreciate you so much. And, and the like-minded stuff. This is what gets me off from being straight up. It's and I don't, I don't want to skip around too much because your journey is so special, but obviously I want to be conscious of time. You end up going to the military and Navy mm -hmm. into the yeah. Navy and then yeah. eventually diving school. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually you come out of that. And I know you kind of, do I say regressed a little bit? You work oh, at yeah. the strip club yeah. and you were selling steroids. Yeah. Yeah. So basically uh, the state of Massachusetts gave me an ultimatum my senior year to either go to jail for seven months or join the military. Um, I was getting in trouble, obviously a lot. And it became very apparent to them I wasn't taking the system seriously. So they uh, kind of upped the ante a little bit. So I joined the military, uh, joined the Navy and had the opportunity to, to, to go uh, to the Naval Diving and Salvage Training Center. Uh, six months of intensive training, which I fortunately uh, was able to make it through. And I uh, had the opportunity to be part of one of the most elite communities in all the military. The military did so many amazing things for me as far as helping me really like grow up, teaching me the importance of discipline, attention to detail, okay. having high, high standards. And it gave me purpose. It gave me the, a, a purpose to get up in the morning and, 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 and go out in the world and do something that I could be proud of. And the accompanying structure that, you know, is mandatorily required to accomplish anything in life, regardless of what your purpose is, regardless of what your mission is, in order to successfully execute and continuously move the needle, you have to set yourself up to succeed. And that, that structure has to be a consistent staple in what it is that you're looking to do in the military. You have to be at the same place at the same time, wearing the same thing every day you you know the, the nature of the work varies a little bit but it's it's very structure uh, oriented it's very uh disciplined regimented extremely disciplined and there's a lot of repetition i mean you do a lot of boring things and you do a lot of boring things so when 
you know, those, those real time worst case scenarios hit, you're prepared and, you know, you know what to do. Uh, military was amazing for me. And uh, I grew up a lot in the five years that I served when I got out. Um, I you legitimately lost all of my purpose, all of that structure, basically overnight. And uh, ultimately found myself working in the strip club where, you know, it's the opposite of uh, the military as far as the schedule, the, the etiquette, the, the, the discipline and all that. And uh, I just, I hated that environment. I found myself kind of slipping back into some of my old, like uh, hostile ways and my mentality. And I didn't like it. I didn't, I, I was aware of this and I didn't like it. And I eventually just got sick of it and I quit and uh, subsequently became a steroid dealer. Yeah. And then eventually, I know that led to, at some point you started nutrition solutions. So forth, but this would obviously resurface and, and someone that was, I think in this space, you know, the dealing and so mm -hmm. forth got in trouble and yep. it in their eyes and so forth. Yeah. So I, I sold steroids for, I don't know, seven, eight years. And that's all I did. I didn't have a job. I didn't, uh, you know, live a, like try to live a conservative life. I mean, I was just the worst kind of drug dealer that you can ever think of. I drove like flashy cars. I was very well known in the, in the, in, in the city I was living in at the time, I was very loud. And, you know, all that was clearly looking back on it was due to a huge insecurity and, and this lack of confidence and just trying to overcompensate for just how miserable I was feeling on the inside. And uh, yeah, I was living that life, fast life, like making money, making cash, partying all the time, getting up whenever I wanted to feel, whenever I felt like getting up, doing what I want to do, partying five, six, seven nights a week during different stages uh, in my 20s. And inevitably, it got to a point where I uh, realized that like, you know, I, I, I didn't see longevity in this. And I started to become aware that people in the game, uh, the same game as me, maybe they weren't selling steroids, maybe they were selling other drugs, but there was a circle of us and we all knew each other. And, you know, some of us hung out together and people just started to get in trouble and get sent to prison and everybody was snitching on everybody. And I, it was pretty apparent to me that it was only a matter of time looking at these people who I was connected with in some capacity. It was only a matter of time before my card was pulled, my luck ran out. And, uh, you know, I was set forth on the same path that, uh, you know, they were with sent to prison, federal prison, whatever the case is. And, I, I just kind of came consumed, not by the thought of going to prison that, to be honest with you, didn't really, that wasn't very like scary for me. It was more the, the thought of regressing and, and, and going back to being that just person that I, I was, you know, growing up, someone who was just not very much in control of my own facilities and just didn't have confidence. And just that feeling of regression overall just started to really kind of eat away at me inside. And I would get just horrible anxiety thinking that at any given time, my door could get kicked in and that would be the end. And I, uh, that anxiety basically was a call to action for me to begin my personal development journey. And, uh, you know, I was a drug dealer, didn't have a lot of time or excuse me, didn't have, I had a lot of time on my hands, didn't have any really real responsibilities outside of selling the shit that I was selling. So with the time that I had, which was uh, a, a substantial amount, I started reading everything and anything I could get my hands on. I mean, this was back in like 2010. Um, before, Tony Robbins. Yeah, Tony Robbins, before the podcasts and, you know, YouTube videos and yeah. social. I had uh, well, you know, personal a personal development was trendy. Yeah, I had uh, Tony, the Tony Robbins. He had like the, these CD sets that I, I used to listen to. And um, so, yeah, I started that process, man. And, and just through the, the, the obsession that it became, um, Love that just started to doing things a little better and started to feel a little better as a result of doing these things better, started to just develop my discipline back that I just decided to like forego after I left the military and, you know, good things started to happen. I was in a, a higher frequency and, 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 and operating from a, a higher vibration and, and, and lo and behold, an opportunity presented itself to, uh, start my company. And, and, you know, I started, um, in a, a very, very different place than we are now as, as everybody does in the beginning. But what was important is to me was just uh, getting something going that was legitimate, that was official, something that I could actually sink my teeth into and wake up in the morning and feel good about and go to sleep at night with a clear conscience. Um, 
you know, knowing that I'm actually doing something legitimate and credible. And the first couple of years were hard, man. I mean, I didn't know, I didn't have a business background. I, I don't have an education or, uh, uh, you know, mentors to kind of guide me through the process. Of course, throughout my journey, I've, I've uh, uh, developed relationships with certain people who ultimately um, became mentors, but I was just winging it, man. I was just figuring out there weren't any other companies at the time doing uh, what, you know, we do at a larger level, like there is now to where I could just kind of like model them, nor did I actually even have the ca mental capacity or awareness to even think to do that at the time. But I was just doing, you know, doing what I could to try to improve and, and, and using the network that I had through uh, selling steroids in the club to kind of develop a customer base. Um, and things started to, to progress. I, you know, uh, uh, we grew and started doing business in a separate city. So now we went from being a local company to doing business in two cities. Um, and, you know, I remember one day, this was in uh, 2015, uh, in June, about 2015, I came home, had a pretty good day. I remember having a good day up until that point, came home to uh, the condo that I was living in at the time and uh, was welcomed home by two plainclothes detectives from the Tampa Police Department who were there to uh, arrest me for warrant I had for uh, numerous uh, felony and steroid Chris, charges. Correct for a second. It was at this time that you just started to really get some momentum. Things started to, yeah, but I look back on it like... At the time, yes, looking back on it, I was still disorganized as hell. I, you know, weren't, wasn't doing anything notable. But yeah, I'd started to kind of catch a stride. Things started to go pretty good. I was feeling pretty confident about the direction things were headed. I, I, I had left. I, it had been, you know, three, three and a half years since I'd, ever, uh, since I had sold anything. I, I exited that life. Um, exited that life, I would say probably a good year into my business completely, wiped my hands clean of it, or so I thought. So yeah, uh, you know, karma came back to, 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 to catch up with me as karma will do. And um, yeah, that was a tough process. But, you know, at the time, it was it, it was one of those things where uh, uh, they were trying to make an example out of me, I did not want to cooperate. I not did not want to cooperate. I I respectfully refused to cooperate and, and articulated my reasons why they not only don't like when you do that, I don't think they were anticipating that that was going to be the case. I think they saw that I had started a business and was doing pretty good and I had a lot to lose. So from their perspective, they, you know, thought that I'd be able to kind of lead them to other things and, and help them make other arrests. I, uh, you know, taking personal responsibility over my past was one of the first things that I did during the infancy stages of my personal development journey to, to even begin to start creating a better life. Like I had to take full responsibility for everything that I had done and stop the excuses, stop the victim mindset bullshit and stop blaming anything and anybody blame myself, realize that some of the things that have happened to me, although, you know, some of them I couldn't control couldn't control the abuse growing up, couldn't control the environment that I was in, couldn't control a lot of those things. But as an adult, I certainly had the ability to control how I responded to them and where I took my life from there. So sure. the thought of setting somebody else up, sending somebody else to prison, destroying their life, destroying their family, because I wasn't willing to accept personal responsibility for my actions. It just wasn't something that was even an option. And I, I communicated that to them. And they uh, basically, you know, uh, were trying to put me in, in, in prison for a long time. The, the offer that they made, which, you know, they'll make you an offer, um, which is normally not, um, in this case, not only skipping that, when I was the rest of my bail was half a million dollars for ster uh, selling steroids. That's unheard of. Um, there are child molesters who have bail less than a hundred grand. Um, people who could shoot somebody else and have a half a million dollar bail. So again, they were trying to make it difficult on me. And I'm not, again, making excuses. I, had I not been in that situation in the first place, there would be no situation to make sure. difficult. But um, yeah, man, I, I went through an extensive legal process looking at uh, some serious time you know, in prison. I decided to fight it, not in the sense of uh, uh, trying to deny my guilt. Um, it, the opposite, in fact, I I took full responsibility from day one against the advice of my own attorney. Um, you know, I, I wanted the court to see that 
who I was now. I was that person. And, and, and a lot of the things that were in the documents they had and the reports that they, were, they had written up, a lot of that stuff was true. Um, but I changed my life and I was hoping that uh, we would be able to show them that. And, um, you know, fortunately, I, I, we, we were. I, I didn't get sent to prison. I literally prepared my entire life uh, to, to have to go to prison. I walked into a courtroom sentencing hearing, which, um, you know, the weeks leading up to that, I was frantically and desperately doing everything I could to prepare myself for the strong possibility that I'd be going to prison that day and, and, and not get out for at least, well, at least two years. Um, but that was the offer that they gave me. When you don't accept the offer and you go to a, a sentencing normally, it's, it's a lot more due to the fact that you're taking up their time, the resources and and all that. But um, yeah, it was a tough process, man, a character building time. But it was also um, another life altering moment that completely changed the trajectory of my life. Because up until that point, even though I thought I was working hard, I, I, I really wasn't. I wasn't as committed to my business as I needed to be. And again, I, I don't think I was really aware of it. But really, from that point forward, I literally became just obsessed with gratitude. And I was so grateful that I didn't get sent to prison. I was so grateful that, you know, the, the, this court, the system, the universe saw that I had done enough to kind of begin to just change my life and work on being a better person that they gave me this, this, this gift, this gift of time that I, I made a, a decision that day to, from that point forward, do everything I could to, to, to consciously get the most out of every single second of every single day and just do so in the highest state of gratitude and being in that mindset and, and developing that mindset has uh it's helped me do some pretty awesome things over the last five years and you know the truth is i haven't even gotten started so yeah for the audience listening don't blink you might miss something Craig is just getting <laughs> up. and also i just want to give you an acknowledgement real quickly something that we didn't touch upon right when you first started the personal development journey before nutrition solution i know you started participating and giving back and, and like feeding yeah. people and so forth and and I love that you did that. I know that made you feel some type of way and you carried it with you to this day. The way that yeah. you were just painting the picture of you like with the courtroom and at the end, like that's like movie-esque. Like I could just picture that. And then obviously once that was in the rear view in the past, now you can clear head. I mean, like the shackles are off. Now it's time to fly with Nutrition Solutions. Obviously, in my personal opinion, there's, there's no company on the planet like it. It's not just a meal prep company. It's a lifestyle. It's exploding. It's the best. It's led by you, the visionary. What changed from after you kind of were able to put that in the past and to really take this thing going? And where is this thing going? Yeah, yeah. So, so this was, you know, uh, the court date, my sentencing. This is a little over four years ago. Um, you know, since then, we've probably 15 x the company um, and just created a, like a, a brand with a special culture before, before the, that event. I didn't have, uh, there wasn't a culture in my mind, you know, I knew I wanted one, but I really started to look at how I was carrying myself, uh, the leadership that I was not providing and just decided that, you know, in order for this company to, to become something special and for me to, 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 to feel fulfilled and to pay it forward to the universe for this, this gift that I was just given, I needed to do things differently. And um, you know, just started to work really, really hard on not just improving myself, but incorporating a lot of the elements that I utilized to, and I still utilize to better myself, really worked on integrating that into the business as far as, um, you know, exercise, I pay my employees to exercise, we start every morning is started off with a uh, gratitude 90 minute or 90 seconds of gratitude to basically prime everybody's mindset, get them in that peak mental state to yeah. then execute the day, uh, the day in. We do community service, uh, donating our, 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 our food and meals to the homeless and less fortunate, going out in the community and just picking up trash, making the world a little cleaner. Like all of these things that, you know, help me basically uh, take back control of my life and, and, and start to become a better person. Um, you know, I've incorporated that into the business. Um, we put a lot of time and energy and, and monies and resources into the, the personal and professional development of the team. Like, you know, whether it's, it's sending them to some of the best leadership events, you know, in the world or like uh, putting them through ice bath evolutions where I literally stick them in an ice bath for five minutes and kind of teach them how to breathe properly and, and, and embrace uh, getting comfortable in the most uncomfortable of situations. Like, you know, we're building soldiers at Nutrition Solutions. I mean, our, our mission is to literally 
you know, help people dominate their goals and create lifestyle transformations. Yeah. And to order, in order to successfully do that, like you can't just be like an average motherfucker who doesn't live the lifestyle. You have to be committed to the shit. You have to be oh, doing it yourself. Savage. And yeah, like, you know, like I, I take a great deal of pride in knowing that my uh, clients and the outside world know that the people at Nutrition Solutions are on the same journey that they're on. And, and, you know, not all of them look like me or are built like me or at the same level of fitness that I'm at currently. Um, there are some that are, but everybody is, you know, we have people that are just starting their journey. We have people that, you know, have been on it for a little while, but we're all on the same journey. And, and you know, fitness is one of those things is that it brings people together. It, you know, unites people, people come together, unified towards a common objective. And it just makes the world a better place because the fitter you are, the, 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 the better your attitude, the better your confidence, the better your mindset, the better your self-belief, um, you know, the, the easier it is to live on a state of gratitude when you're just waking up and you're like, you feel good. You feel good because you know you're, 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 you're healthy. You feel good. You know you fucking look good. And then you're able to do good because of those things. So, you know, through the, the, the process of, of, of eating well and getting exercise, like, you know, you're able to come become a better person and not just like look better naked and have abs and, and all that, but just like do more good in the world, whether it's business, whether it be, be a better mother or father, or just be a better, more productive human being that to put you in a position to leave the world a little better than you found it when this thing is all said and done. You're such a visionary brother. And just like me, you're obsessed. And, and I love that about you. And like, you know, you can only connect the dots in life looking backwards. And like, even just having this whole conversation and we ran through it, but like, holy shit, what a journey. And it's so impressive. And like you said earlier in the conversation, you're just getting warmed up. And for the audience listening, like I always worked out with weights for about 15 years and not professional or anything. That was just my thing. That was my outlet. A few years back, I signed up with Nutrition Solutions and I started to get my nutrition down. I never really understood nutrition. I would yeah. just, and then I started running marathons and I had never done cardio. I ran four marathons in 2019. Good for you, about, brother. Thank you, buddy. I'm about to ass dominate Chicago, October 10th. But I just wanted to say to the audience, like once I started incorporating the nutrition aspect of it, specifically Chris and his company, it changed everything for me because look, you can work out all the time. It's great. But if you don't have a game plan when it comes to nutrition, if you're not structured, you're never going to look as good as you possibly can be, or even feel as good as you possibly can be. One of the other good things about being on a meal prep specifically, Chris, is it not only you know, does it help you look great, but it keeps you disciplined. You don't have to think, you don't have to wake yeah. up and go rogue. What am I going to eat today? Throw one in the oven, the microwave every, every three hours, bang, you don't have to think the emotions out of it, stay shredded, look good, feel good. So it's a no brainer. And I know for a fact, me personally, it changed my life. Thank you, man. I, I appreciate that. And, you know, to your point, like anything that we could do out there to conserve energy and save energy and not have to worry about something like, you know, we want to take advantage of that. And I'm not saying necessarily utilizing a meal prep company that ours or one like ours, but taking dedicated time to, to prepare healthy food for the next several days to put you in a position where you always have something healthy to reach for because all too often, you know, life where everybody's busy, right? A lot, lot going on and it's very easy to, you know, go a long time or all day even without eating. And then, you know, you get super hungry and typically the nearest thing to reach is something that probably isn't going to do anything positive for the betterment of your health or goals or any of that. So it's just about being prepared yes. and, you know, being organized and, and being prepared and being organized Playing is chess. being in control. Yep. Exactly. hundred percent. I was just at a big speaking engagement at Myrtle beach last weekend and I brought all my meals with me. So I don't have to think I don't go rogue. So I love that you said that. We'll end it with this, buddy. I got to ask you, I'm sure the audience is wondering, you look like a, a, a terminator. Absolutely. Well, like, <laughs> What is your fitness routine right now? Yeah, so just so we get clear, when we say fitness, right, we're talking about like the exercise portion of it for this? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to add in a couple other elements that people might not add in, but my fitness routine is pretty comprehensive. Um, I weight train four days a week. I have two days that are dedicated just to functional training where, you know, I'm doing uh, body weight, body weight movements, burpees, uh, you know, hand cleans, pull-ups, things like that, using the row machine, kettlebells. Um, I do, I integrate cardio about four days a week and I'll, I'll normally do that in the morning fasted 
if you know, I, I don't have the time to do, or I just don't feel like doing it because I do uh, stretching, whatever, then I'll do it at night. But I, I do those th three things consistently at the, uh, at the frequency that I just described. Two other elements that I, I implemented consistently in 2020 were utilizing the sauna and stretching. And when I go deep in, a little deeper into that, see a lot of people will tell you they stretch or they use the sauna. People go to the gym and they, you know, kind of like move their arms around a little bit or do a little windmill with their shoulders before they go to train. But I'm talking actual regimented uh, stretching routine where I'm dedicating uh, 25 minutes towards an actual stretching program. I do that three days a week. I do a sauna three to four days a week, no less than three um, if max, it'll be four. And I'm, when I'm in the sauna, I'm doing it for minimum 20 minutes. 20 minutes is the magic number at 180 degrees. Uh, the benefits that I've experienced over the last you know year and a half by uh, implementing stretching and the sauna in my routine has just helped me live better. Not only has it helped me improve you know my fitness in the traditional training capacity, that's not why I do it. That's not at all why I do it. Um, although it certainly helps being able to just be more flexible and mobile and um, have my body just be more uh, fluid in my movements, like, you know, standing up, sitting down, like you just feel better and you gain that awareness through the consistency. But stretching is one of those things where it's very difficult to get into and to uh, to recognize the value in it if you've never done it before. I hope that you know this compels at least one person it to will. actually do it and stick with it because it's only through the process of consistency that our brains are able to develop that new positive neurological connection that makes the association between the activity and the benefit. So it's one of those things where a little faith and belief needs to be present up front but it will literally uh, change every facet of your life. And the, the sauna uh, as well. The sauna does some amazing things. And, and, and again, I don't do these, uh, these two elements that I'm uh, referring to that I know a lot of people don't do. A lot of people go in the sauna, they'll pop in a sauna for a few minutes, five minutes maybe. And as soon as it gets hot, that's when they exit. Right, right. You know, <laughs> as soon as it gets hot and you start to feel uncomfortable, that's actually like the beginning of when yes. the good things start to happen. So you're doing yourself a disservice by exiting after, uh, oh. you know, once it gets uh, uncomfortable. By 20 of the marathon, that's when it begins. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're we're talking about improving health and longevity and being more functional. And, uh, you know, a lot of people that just hit the gym and, and do the traditional, um, you know, bodybuilding workouts, like, um, you know, I encourage you to keep doing that. But I think a lot of people get that get to a point where they hit a plateau and they say, oh, you know, I'm not able to make any progress and I'm having a hard time doing this. And you talk to them and they'll quickly explain to you that they're following the same routine they have been for the last 10, 15 fucking years, doing the same thing, expecting something to change. And that's just not the way it works, not in the gym, uh, not in business, not in life. So right by incorporating the functional movements and functional exercises, it'll give you the ability to kind of punch through that glass ceiling, uh, break through that plateau and um, just help you improve on overall aesthetics as well. I, I can't stress that enough. The functional movements really help develop that more kind of athletic look that, you know, is, is, is obviously high, highly uh, desirable. Yeah, I love all this. And, and for the audience listening, is there anyone really more credible when it comes to fitness and lifestyle than Chris? Obviously, you should take what he's saying into consideration. I just want to let you know, brother, I'm a huge fan of yours. I respect the hell out of you. I love you. I'm a client of yours, and I'll be an advocate until my last breath. I know the audience is going to be obsessed with you in two seconds. Where can they support you? Where can they find you? Where do you hang out the most? Instagram? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. First of all, thank you for having me on, man. That was fun. I appreciate it. The interview was great. And uh, just thank you so much for being a client, supporting us uh, over the years and not just supporting us being an advocate like that that really means a lot to me you guys make everything possible everything that i do and everything that i'm able to do is uh possible because of the opportunity that people like yourself give us so uh it, it really means a lot to me absolutely brother where can we all yeah. keep up with you yeah absolutely instagram chris cavallini my name uh facebook youtube um yeah all the uh all the usual suspects I love it. And the truth of the matter is I could talk to you all day, but I just want to respect time. I just want to let you know, Chris, you don't shy away from your challenges as they've shaped you. It's something I find very relatable and liberating. 
You are the definition of resilience, grit, and heart from growing up with humble beginnings and several arrests in your youth to joining and becoming a young man in the Navy, later hitting rock bottom to bouncing off and now providing the support, resources, and healthy lifestyle to millions. You're an inspiration to anyone coming up today. You're a visionary. I could personally guarantee your best is yet to come. You're someone I admire, I appreciate, and I respect very much. I love you. I can't wait to continue to watch you fly. This will definitely not be the last time we collaborate. And I will absolutely continue to spread your message and what Nutrition Solutions stands for until my very last breath. Man, I love you too, brother. Thank you so much for those kind words. That, that's, uh, that's awesome. That was awesome. Let's keep in touch, Chris. This was so much fun. Thank you, brother. Absolutely. Thank you. The pleasure was mine.